open your Bibles to the book of Sephaniah in the Old Testament. It's right after Habakkuk. Before Haggai. Before then, I want to read you a couple messages that came in that addresses something I want to just quickly get to tonight before we move on. But this first message is a good summary of what was taught last Monday evening on the wedding ceremony. I'll read to you first. Last night, we were given an additional name for Rosh Hashanah, the festival of the last trump. The left horn of the ram God provided for Abraham to sacrifice in place of Isaac represents the first trump, and the right horn represents the last trump according to ancient Jewish interpretations. For the Jews, they see the left horn as representing the birth of Israel and the right horn as the complete restoration. But for those born from above, the left horn represents the birth of the church and the right horn represents our complete restoration or the redemption of our bodies. And that time, we will be raptured and fully restored. While well, having a couple directions you can go with the teaching, you chose the Jewish wedding ceremony. It had two stages, the Hitrit Rusin, C-H-I-T-R-E, second word E-R-U-S-I-N, that's for the transcribers, and Kiddushin Ketubah, Ketuba, first word K-I-D-D-U-S-H-I-N hyphen K-E-T-U-B-A-H. The first stage is drawing up the contract, and at the time that the bride price was paid, then the groom would go to build a house for himself and his bride. That contract being fulfilled, the second stage was the actual wedding ceremony. There was a span of time between the two events as if it would take time for him to build a place for them both. Then at the Kedushin Ketubah, there were two witnesses that assisted the bride and groom. The bride would circle the groom three times, and at a particular point, the bride and groom would leave the party to consummate the marriage with the friend of the bridegroom listening outside. Upon completion, the friend of the bridegroom would announce the marriage complete. It is, it's interesting that Jewish sages, when talking about the bride circling three times, refer to Hosea, since Hosea is about the betrothal and, not, and not the actual ceremony. I can see where they drew a link between the Kudishin and Ketubah and Jeremiah 31, 22, but how they came up with the actual figure of three the three, three times he circled, she circled around the groom, isn't readily apparent. How did they come up with the three? Okay, that's one message. I got many messages because I guess I left that part out. What about that three times going around in a circle around the groom? Here's another message. Thanks for the evening's teaching. I thought this teaching the ancient weddings ceremony was very helpful in understanding what's going to take place at the rapture. Layer upon layer from different angles, you make God's word understandable. Tonight was no exception. For example, what John the Baptist said in the third chapter of John was brought forth from the shadows into the light. Before it was like, what on earth is John, Baptist, John the Baptist talking about? Now it's, I <clears throat> now, now it's I understand. This is why you're a gift minister because you bring forth concise understanding of God's word. Thank you. The only thing I don't understand is why the bride goes around the groom three times. Perhaps I missed it when I was writing notes. I will listen again to this teaching for sure. The teaching from the Midrash was also helpful with their explanation of the right and left ram's horn and what they mean. As well the Bible verses of Hosea and Jeremiah. The festival of the last trump is a day I'm looking forward to. The, the, the festival of the last trump is a day I'm looking forward to. <clears throat> so what about this? bride going around the groom three times is a very short explanation. Now there's several explanations out there but I only think one that comes even close to describe what happened during the ceremony. The bride going around the groom three times is as simple as this. The bride is notifying, declaring Proclaiming the groom is the center of her world. 
It's as simple as that. I don't even want to complicate that. And of course, being form, born from above, the groom is our center of our world. Or else, there is not much purpose in what we're doing, what we're living for, what we're hoping for. It's as simple as that. Now, Jewish scholars try to complicate it a little bit, try to find a deeper meaning for it. There isn't one. That bride and us is telling everyone that's an onlooker to the ceremony that the groom is the center of her world. Short and simple. Now, I'm glad you asked me that question because I was going to mention that, but I guess I overlooked it when I was teaching on that wedding ceremony last Monday evening. Now, let's move on. I want you to write this Hebrew word down. Natsal. Or Natsal. N-A-T-Z-A-L. Now, a part of the ritual of Rosh Hashanah consists of, and you need to spell this out also, Z-I-H-K-R-O-N-O-T. Zigronot. Like I said, part of the ritual, the Rosh Hashanah, consists of the Zigronot, or Book of Remembrance. Book of Remembrance. The Book of Remembrance being opened and the Natsal occurring. Now, Natsal is a Hebrew word that we can correspond it with the Greek word harpizo, or harpizo, H A R P I Z O. Now, harpizo is a New Testament Greek word you find in the New Testament. And we define or translate that word as rapture in the New Testament. So not so means a catching away. A catching away. You got it? Now, you're not going to find this word in the scriptures, not so. It's not found. But the ancient rabbis, and even today, used the term that was coined long ago based out of Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. Let's go to it. Let's read the verses. Gather yourselves together, verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation, not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass, as the chaff before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness, it may ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. What this verse is saying, the righteous ones of the nation will be hidden or taken away before the day of the Lord's anger, 
which, by the way, will consist of both the living and the dead that we find in the scriptures that clearly states the living and the dead both the living and the dead and the Messiah and you go to Daniel chapter 12 just a few pages back verses 2 and three, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now the word everlasting there is not a good translation. It should be for an age, but those of you listening to the teaching know exactly what I mean. And they shall be wise, and they that be wise, excuse me, shall shine, shall shine, or be enlightened, as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness, as the stars, forever and ever. So, with these two sections of verses that we looked in, in Daniel and in Zephaniah, this, the word gathering that we find in the scriptures here is, is used of the hiding of both the living and dead believers. But the word not so that the rabbis used referred to the living believers who are changed. It's amazing how they knew that. Even in Old Testament times who are changed and then was hidden with the rest of the changed ones. In other words, they're hidden from the Lord's anger and wrath. That's coming. And of course, many of the rabbis compared it to Enoch and Elijah being changed and caught up. And caught up. Just about out of time. That was a quick hour, wasn't it? This is just another e example that we can piece together with secular, not, not necessarily secular sources, but other religious, let's just call it that, sources, and the scriptures to connect all the dots. That verifies God's word once again of what we already know that is already described for us in the New Testament starting 2,000 years ago. But like I'm pointing it out, like, like I'm pointing out that it's not just 2,000 years ago, it goes even further back than that. God's been saying through His words and the people that He chose to communicate those words to to relate to us <clears throat> that He's coming. There is going to be a second coming. There is going to be a rapture the way I taught the rapture is going to take place. And there is going to be a day of wrath that's coming along with it. Not for us. Not for the believers. We'll be hidden. Changed and hidden from that wrath. But the unbelievers won't be so lucky. they'll find that their state of denial was definitely foolish. And there's a reckoning coming. And Scripture has been, been saying that for a very long time. In fact, the word Zephaniah, you know what that translates to? You know what that defines to? 
the Lord hides. The Lord hides. He's been promising that we don't have to deal with that type of wrath if we, if we are in Him. And Him means Jesus Christ only. There is no other rescue plan. That's a plan you want to be a part of. Not that all, their, not all that other false plans that are out there are no plans because they don't even believe there's a God to start with. I choose to believe that He does exist. And that's where I put my trust and faith in. The Lord Jesus and God the Father. Now, I'm out of time, but I'm not done. There's more concerning the Feast of the Trumpets. I'll get to it next time. Play a song.